Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. So as we kick off Tale of Two Trees, you know, the funny tagline that we came up with, I was like, no, this will be good. This is sticky. Is uh, the tagline for this series is, which way do you swing? Why don't you just turn to the person beside you and ask them, which way do you swing? I'm going to make it awkward today. <laughs> uh, so we're going back to the beginning. Sometimes to really understand something significant, you need to go back to the beginning. Uh, I, I know even for myself, um, after I lost my dad a bit over a year ago, I just was like, I need, I'm going to go take, I'm going to get some counseling because I'm an advocate for that. I think it's great. And uh, it's so good. Some good Christian counseling can be so helpful in any area of your life. And so I just, I just wanted to, you know, just See how I was processing it. And you always end up going back to the beginning of things to really understand stuff. And I see that even when I take time to pray with people and stuff. So often, I don't want to just pray the symptom. I want to get to the real thing that's going on. And so when I'm praying with maybe a guy who's, you know, struggling with an addic addiction or just, just a, a, an attitude or a mindset that they can't seem to shift, you know, we want to say, well, like, where did that start? What got all that going? And today, that's kind of what we're doing because for us to truly understand the human condition that we all are a part of, we have to go back to the very start of God's creation plan, which took place with Adam and Eve in a garden with two trees. And so that's what we're going to do today. And I want to read, I'm going to read uh, just the account right off the bat to, to start. So this is the, the section that we're going from in Genesis 2. And it says this, it says, The eternal God planted a garden in the east of Eden, a place of utter delight, and placed the man whom he had sculpted there. In this garden, he made the ground pregnant with life, bursting forth with nourishing food and luxuriant beauty. He created trees, and in the center of this garden of delights stood the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A little later on, it says, The eternal God placed the newly made man in the garden of Eden in order to work the ground and care for it. He made certain demands of the man regarding life in the garden. This is really good. It says, eat freely from any and all trees in the garden. I only require that you abstain from eating the fruit of one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Beware, the day you eat the fruit of this tree, you will certainly die. I'm gonna pray to kick things off. God, I thank you that you love to just unpack truth. You love to teach us. Wisdom, not just for ourselves, but uh, uh, beyond that. And I just pray today that you would just help us really uh, clue into to the powerful truths that you want to communicate to every single one of us so that we can live the lives you've designed us to live in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to start things off with a question that kind of shapes this message. I want you to just ask yourself this. What is my approach to God? Just think about that for a minute. What is my approach to God? We all have approaches to different things in life. Uh, how you approach your boss, how you view your boss, right? Are you like, mm, because the way you view him is harsh or maybe, maybe your boss is really great. So it's easy for you to knock on the door and walk in and have a chat. How do you approach your boss? How do you approach uh, your friends? How do you approach family members? How do you approach the clerk at the, at the grocery store? How do you approach your neighbor? We have approaches, and it's the same with God. How do you approach God? What is your view? What is your perspective? What is the lens that you see him with? Because how you see him and how you view God and approach God will shape your entire life. And really, this stems back from the very beginning with two trees. You are always, always swinging towards one of these trees. You are swinging towards the tree of life, or you are swinging towards the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you notice they don't really look any different. 
And that's kind of on purpose too. I didn't want make one to make look one to look super attractive and one to be like, eh, no, that's the bad tree. You know what? Sometimes it's not that easy to tell. And that's really where I want to take some time today is, is recognizing that we are always at some point swinging towards one tree or the other. You are camped in one tree or the other. And we don't always recognize that, but it's important for us if we're going to live the life God wants us to do. And so today I want to unpack the tree of life. Today we're going to talk more about the tree of life. And next week, my wife Joy, she's going to tackle the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And especially if you're like, oh, like what's bad about knowledge of good and evil? You know what? I'm, I'm going to touch on it today, but really next week is when you're really going to understand the significance of this. And it's going to be a great message. So today, though, as we talk about the tree of life... We're looking again at what happened in the garden. So Adam and Eve are told by their creator, you can have all of this. Like, guys, go nuts. Have fun. Enjoy everything I have made. There's just one area I want you to, to keep away from. That's not good for you. And Adam and Eve are eventually tempted by the serpent, comes and says, you know what? God doesn't know what he's talking about. You can have this. And as as Adam and Eve start to listen to this temptation and consider and ponder, this is what it says in Genesis 3, 6. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So she ate it and Adam ate it. Now, lots of times people are like, Eve started everything. I'd like to point out, that this is probably all, this is also the first epic husband fail because I, can you imagine husbands like standing there? You were watching your wife get seduced and you say nothing? That's a fail. So both these guys at the same time, they fail and they, they, they allow this to overtake them and they see, ooh, this looks good. And so they eat and in, in their eyes, the fruit was good to eat. It, it seemed good to take these things. And you know, it's like, I know God says not to, but just look at it. It looks good. How could this possibly be bad for me? How could, come on. Yeah, God, I know you say that, but I don't know what you're talking about, man. This looks perfectly fine for me. And that, you can just apply that right now to any area of your life. And they might be past regrets that you're like, yes, that was exactly what I was thinking in that moment. Or maybe it's stuff even right now. It's like, mm, how am I? Where, where am I viewing this certain thing? And in a moment, they unlocked the power of sin. Oh, sin. No, we don't need to talk about that. That's an irrelevant word in 2020. We don't, we, don't, we, we don't have major dictators like destroying our lives and causing wars. And all. You know, no, no, there's nothing real going on. So we kind of disassociate from sin sometimes because we think it's something bigger. But what I'm talking about today is this. Let me explain it like this. Sin is the desire to call the shots myself. It's autonomy, which means self-rule. I got this. I don't need God. I got this. I don't need God. And it's defining good and evil for myself. The problem is people are horrible at defining good and evil for ourselves. We are not good at it. Like we, how do we even decide that? How do we decide what is good or evil? How do we decide who decides good or evil? Do I just say like, hey, Scott Lindahl, you get to decide for everyone here what is good and evil. I don't know. I don't know if I trust your judgment. <laughs> you probably would do an okay job. But it's one of those things where it's just like, really? We think we can handle what is good and right. Because we're all different. We're all different in our perspective. And come on, since everything fell apart back at the garden, our culture thrives on excess and compromise, and we declare things are normal. We even encourage them in many ways. Man, however you handle your money, however you handle your sexuality, you just do you. You just live the way you want to live. You figure it out. You do it the way you want. Even government and media, organizations that are designed to bring order to our life, they end up painting pictures that, hey, these things, they're good and right. And you know what? We decided they're good and right. That's why they're good and right. So it's like, let's just, you know what? I know we've done, this has been this way forever, but let's just change this law. Let's just decide it's, it's okay. Let's, let's tweak the national anthem. It's okay. We're doing, we're doing the right thing here. No, no, no. It's, it's right. Trust us. 
We know what we're doing. It's the right thing to do. And we just accept it. Now, constantly throughout God's story, people chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They chose it over and over again. This autonomy, this self, I could figure it out. You see this, you see this phrase over and over throughout the Bible. In Judges 17, 6, there's an example. It says, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. I'm going to say, right in their own eyes. They just did whatever they viewed right in their own eyes eyes and over and over and over. This is a story that is ongoing and causes problems. And it all started with a test of two trees. And so the story of garden, the, the story of the garden really is the foundation for our human condition, our human existence. We find this situation. I mean, think about that test. Like why, maybe you've asked this question, why would a good God put such a risky test right in the center of the garden? Like, come on, doesn't he want them to live a certain way? Doesn't he want them to, to follow him, whatever? And yet, you're telling me that the tree of life is right beside the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's just sitting there together? What are you doing, God? But the choice is always there. And to experience life, we got to realize, if we want to get to life, we have to walk past we have to walk past knowledge, these things. And, and when I say knowledge, make sure, I mean, again, you're going to get more of this next week. But knowledge is not just saying like, oh, you're either smart or you just follow Jesus. Like, it's not that, okay? I'm not saying that that's what that is. It's a different kind of knowledge. It's that self-knowledge. I can figure it out on my own. I can do it on my own. We have to walk past the choices every day at work, at school, in relationships, and say, I, you know what? I don't think that's the right way. I'm going to go over here to where life is, and I'm going to trust God's best for me. Every good thing in my life is matched by an equal or greater opportunity to ruin it. Every good thing I have in my life, there is opportunity to ruin it. I have been as intentional as I can to be the best husband and father that I can be, but it only takes a moment for me to head over to the wrong tree and I can screw it all up. There's always going to be opportunity to ruin what, I've, what we've worked so hard to be a part of and what we're following. And humanity has to choose every day between a tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, between the living tree and the killing tree. And we get to choose every day. And maybe you're sitting here, it's like, but do I have to choose? Like, does it actually matter if I just hang out in one tree? Like, like, what's the big deal? And it is a big deal. And it is a big deal because if, if, if you don't understand why it's important and you're just like, well, whatever, then you don't understand what you were designed for. You don't understand what you were created to do and be a part of. And it goes back to what God had set up at the beginning. That man and woman were made in his image and they were designed with a role and a purpose to reflect God's character out into our world, to bring change and health and wholeness. We were appointed to rule on his behalf. Like he set up the garden, laid out a couple ground rules, handed over the keys and said, go for it, guys. Like that's a huge responsibility that God has equipped us to be able to do. And it's still our mandate. It's still who we're supposed to be when you go to work, when you go to school, whatever it is, you are designed to rule and reflect God. That is our job. And so, yeah, it matters what tree we are in. And to rule, we need true wisdom that comes from one tree, not the knowledge of self. We need real wisdom that comes from the tree of life, which is an essential part of God's original plan. You see, the tree of life, there's a, it's actually a common theme. You can find chunks of it throughout, throughout Scripture, throughout the Bible. You'll see elements where they refer to it. Uh, in Proverbs, there's some examples. It says in 3.18, it says, Wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her, and blessed will be all who hold firmly to her. So wisdom is a tree of life. Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous, the right living, is a tree of life. So righteousness right? It, which is right living. Often righteousness can be ascribed in like a negative connotation. Oh, you're so self-righteous. Yes, it, it would be negative if it's self-righteous. But righteousness is not meant to be focused on self. Righteous living, right living, lining up with God is meant to be something attractive to our world, 
right? It's not I'm better than you. It's I'm doing this so that you can see it's possible so that we can do this together so we can make this world better. We, we're righteous in a good way, and true wisdom is not designed to inflate our heads. It's meant to come out of us. See, eating from the tree of life is not only meant for us. It's meant to go through us. Everything we obtain from living in this tree is actually meant to then flow through us into the lives of others. That is how we rule and reign in this world. It's how we bring around God's change, everything that he wants to see happen. And when we do this, when we, when we can cause this and bring this all together to flow through us into good creation, that is called shalom. Would you just look at the person beside you and say, shalom. Shalom is a Jewish word which means peace, but it actually means more than just peace than how we think. Shalom means the way things are supposed to be. That's peace. The way things are supposed to be. Well, we have a picture of the way things are supposed to be right at the start in the Bible. We saw the way God had designed things to be for man and woman to work, to cultivate, to grow, and to flourish what he had made, to see it expand and grow. That is what shalom is. It is this coming together, this wholeness. So shalom or peace with God is basking in the beauty of his presence. It's spending time with him, but also inviting other people to experience his goodness. Peace with self. That shalom is, is health and wholeness and hope and comfort. Peace with others, the unity, the security, the lack of violence. Peace with creation should look like, you know, it's our environment, our economy, it's sustaining, it's caring for these things. This is shalom. Our purpose as humans is to co-create with God and to, to, to bring about everything he wanted us to do. And the tree of life was meant to enable an ongoing flourishing or the shalom of God's good creation. So God has defined what is good, yet he is gracious enough to give them a choice. Will they trust God's definition of good and evil, which is found in life? If you trust me, this I can give you what you need. Or do we need to go off and figure it out on our own because we think we know better? Man, I, I, I don't know about you, but like if I could go back in time... It's like, and I had a time machine and I could go to where Adam and Eve were at the tree and they're contemplating and reaching. I would love to say I'd just like run up and be like, no, guys, don't do it. Resist. In reality, I think I would show up, watch them, and probably be the first one to take it off the tree. I don't think we'd do any better than them. There is something in us that pulls us away from God, yet we have to make the choice to say, I don't, I don't want this tree. I want to live out of the tree of life. See, knowledge is this self-focused, self-indulgent kind of thing. I want the thing that God said would kill me. Because I don't know if he knows what he's talking about. It looks pretty good to me. I know he says it would kill me, but I want it anyways. Whereas wisdom is mission focused. It's looking out towards others. It says, yeah, I want this, but I'll let God give it to me in his time on his terms. Yes, I want to sleep with her. Yes, I want to live with him. But you know what? I'm going to wait till it's the right time. I'm going to do this God's way. I believe that this really could be the best, even if it makes sense in my eyes, what's right in my eyes to do. And so we, like Adam and Eve, we are children needing to mature. Adam and Eve, they were the fullness of, of, of humanity, and yet God said, you're going to grow, you're going to learn, you're going to develop. And so they were still in their infancy in this sense. And we're the same way. In our immaturity, we just want to take the fast track, right? I mean, come on. Uh, knowledge, immediate gratification. We want to do it on my terms. I'm going to call the shots. I want it. It looks good. And all of us can relate to this, where mom and dad have said to you, no, or wait, and we just do it anyways, right? No, or wait. And we're like, mm, but I really want to. That's how we broke our arm or went into debt or had our heart broken, right? That's what happened. We opened the door to pain and consequence because we weren't willing to obtain wisdom the best way possible. And we took something. We, we took something instead of allowing God to give us something. See, whatever Adam and Eve and us wanted to take from this, God was like, I have everything you need. 
You think you want something different, but the thing you actually want, I'm providing the whole real version of it. You just don't realize it. And so we took something that God was going to give to us as he unfolded and brought us into maturity. And we can get so caught up on what we can't have and we fail to realize the first command God said was eat freely from all these other trees and enjoy life. So, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Which way are you swinging? In any area of your life, which way are you swinging? It's so important that we recognize the difference between the trees. See, the killing tree says, do more to get to God. Earn his approval. You got to get that way. If you see God as harsh, then you're going to approach him hesitantly. I got to earn his approval. But the living tree says, embrace the fact that Jesus has already done it. He's already done it for you. He loves you while you were still sinners, Romans 5, 8. He says, I embrace you no matter what. Tree of knowledge, the killing tree says, obey out of duty. You just got to do it because you have to do it. You feel obligated. Maybe you feel resentful, but you got to do it. Living tree says, embrace the fact. Embrace the fact that you can obey out of delight. It's not duty. You can obey out of delight. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I want to. I want to read this verse and, and, and think about this for a minute, okay? John 14, 15 says this. Maybe you've heard this verse. Maybe you haven't. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Just look at that for a minute. How do you read that? If you love me, you'll obey what, what, what I command. I wonder if, without realizing it, you, you're camping out in the killing tree and the knowledge tree, and you see it as, if you love me, prove it. Do what I say. Show me you love me. Then I'll know you love me. Or do you see it out of the tree of life? If you, if you love me, on this side of the comma, like this first part of the sentence, if you just love me, if you actually are in love with me, if you, if you are passionate about following me, like for guys, I think it's almost sometimes easier. It's like following that commander into battle. It's just like, man, I'd die for you. I just, whatever, I would follow you no matter what. If that's how you already, if that's the kind of relationship we have, of course you'll do what I command. Why wouldn't you? If you love me, yeah, then of course you're going to do what I command. Of course you're going to trust me. Of course you're going to do it. So where do we live in any area of our life? Knowledge or life? This is where we need to look at. How do you approach God? Right? We give an example. You know, uh, and this is something that's always been close to my heart, but it's a great example that God tells us, he talks about saving sex to marriage, for example. I'll use this one. See, the, the, the killing tree, the knowledge tree says, ah, I need to gather my own understanding. I can't take God at his word. I, you know, I know he says that, but I need to find out. I might, I might, I might sleep around. I might find some compatible partners. I'm going to figure out for myself what works well. Right? Or maybe, maybe we're going to move in together because we need to see if we can function properly as a couple. I don't know about just waiting and then pulling it off. You know, I need to know if this can work. I need to know right now if this can work the way I want. And the world would say, makes sense. Go for it. That's, that's totally fine. Do what's right in your own eyes. But when you live out of the tree of life, the more that you trust God and his incredible countercultural views on life, and you're going to want to live that way. God, I just trust you. And if you say this is the best for me, and if I actually look around and see all the stories and examples of people who chose to wait, who chose these certain areas of their lives, but they said, I'm just going to embrace God's truth in this, and I see the fruit of that. Yeah. Yeah, I can get behind that. I just think it's worth mentioning, at least even to some of the young people here, because I feel like you might not hear this anywhere else in the world. It's worth waiting. If you're debating, because the world's going to tell you, just go for it. I would like to give an alternate option and say, it's worth waiting. I did. I believe in the power of it and the significance of it. And I just think some people just need to hear that it's, you can do it. <laughs> it's worth it. It's what God wants. But it's also, there's so many just amazing benefits of just trusting God in that specific area of your life. And if you're like, ah, oh, it's too late for me. Here's the beautiful thing too. God can restore any way, any aspect. I, you know, I've seen people who've even made the choice. It's like, you know what? I'm already in this relationship. We're just going to take this part of our relationship 
out of the equation for now until we're married because I really want to grow in this relationship and not, it, it, there's so many things. And if, and if there's so much more I could say on that, I just want to say, uh, if you want to look into some of that, some great resource is, uh, uh, Andy Stanley's series, The New Rules for Love, Sex, and Dating. I really encourage you to check that out. But this is just an example for us to see the power of every area of our life we are making a choice and what tree are we living in. So God's big story is that we are on a quest for wisdom. That's what we are designed to do from the start is to, we're desiring wisdom and we were given responsibility to rule on that behalf and we have to pick wisdom with the right motives. So the tree of life isn't just taking one bite and that's it. It's actually meant to be something we continually eat from. I mean, come on, imagine a world that was restored to the way we were meant to function, fully working in shalom. Imagine what that would look like at work, at home with your family in every way. We're meant to be part of that solution. And every day, in every situation, in every relationship that you are in, you get to choose which way you swing and where you camp. And you can evaluate, well, uh, am I in this tree? Hmm. Or am I actually living in this tree of life over here? And in any moment, in any situation, you can make the choice to start swinging that way. God, help me, bring me to where you want me to be. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I gave you the choice today between life and death, between blessing or, or between being blessed or being cursed. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. It's what God was asking us to do from the start, and it's what he's still asking us to do today. And so today, as we wrap this up, I want to encourage you. You know, we started today reading about the tree of life. But if you go to the end of the Bible, and you open Revelation, you're going to find another section where they talk about the tree of life. In Revelation 2.7, it says this, Let the person who is able to hear, listen to, and follow what the Spirit claims to all the churches. I will allow the one who conquers through faithfulness, even unto death, to eat from the tree of life found in God's lush paradise. I'll allow, God is, God is telling us today, I'm going to allow the one who conquers through faithfulness, right? That shalom, that completeness, that wholeness, through righteousness, through wisdom, as you obtain these things, as you live a life that is intentionally moving towards this tree, you're going to experience the fullness of the tree of life. We think, ah, oh, Adam and Eve messed it up. Game over. No way. Jesus said, I'm going to change all of that. And so he made another tree of life. And we just can embrace that. And as we turn to Jesus and we put our faith in him and say, God, lead me in the right way. He allows us to experience what we were meant to experience all along. The fullness of the tree of life and all that it brings to our life. Can we stand up today? Jesus has made a way once again for us to embrace what we were meant to embrace from the very start. And you might think, man, did I miss my chance? My marriage is on the rocks or my kids won't talk to me or this is, I've been in this tree so long. Jesus is always ready to say, just come with me. It might take a bit more work to get over here in this area of your life, but it's always possible and he's doing something new. There was a tree of life at the beginning. There's a tree of life at the end and you were invited to be part of it, but not just for yourself to be part of something bigger because we are a part of a bigger story that God is doing. Or we have a role to play of bringing shalom, the wholeness, the completeness, the peace back to a broken world. And every time you swing back towards this tree, you are bringing shalom. And so I want to invite you today to just, even just as we consider just the areas of our lives where we feel we feel good. It's like, God, I'm thankful that I'm in this tree. I've seen the fruit of that. I commend you for that. And we, this is what we need. This is what we're doing. But we also recognize that there are areas of our lives where maybe we, are, we have swung towards the wrong tree. And yet right now, if we would trust God, he could bring us back around. And maybe you're here today and you've never even, you've never even made the choice to embrace the fact that, that God is bringing you into a new life. And you want to say yes to Jesus. I want to invite you today. With every eye closed, would you just pray with me and just say, Jesus, thank you for the price that you paid, that you created a way through your death and resurrection to reestablish my connection with the tree of life. I want to live out of your fullness. I want to bring that shalom to my world as I head out this week. Empower me, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. So good. God is doing good things. He's stirring new things, and we get to choose what tree we are going to live in. All right. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.